This series uh, is a separately and a uh, separate series and uh, is uh, one of four. This, the first one was held in June and it was uh, an extraordinary event, uh, one in which uh, the audience and our speakers were uh, energized and we hope that today our uh, program will be as effective as that first and we, uh, we're confident about it. Our speakers are lined up and uh, soon you will uh, have an opportunity to hear what they have to say about cybersecurity. Uh, since I'm not an expert, I will uh, be happy to turn the program over to uh, Nasser Memon, uh, who is the uh, program director for cybersecurity and a professor at, uh, in, the, in the computer science and engineering program here at NYU Poly. His research uh, covers a variety of cybersecurity and forensic programs. Uh, he is the recipient of over 15 million, maybe now 20 million, uh, in research from the National Science Foundation and other sources. And he has uh, numerous patents and even has time uh, to run a couple of businesses in cybersecurity. So I give you uh, our distinguished professor, Nasser Memon. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here uh, today. Uh, I, we have a sort of list of featured uh, distinguished speakers, and I, I won't take much of your time. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, about the program we here, have here at uh, NYU Poly. Uh, uh, although sort of Bob gives me the credit for leading the program, uh, there are many other faculty who actually sort of are at uh, the helm of this program. Uh, people like Keith Ross, uh, the chairman of the computer science department who does work in uh, P2P, security, privacy, Justin Kapos who's built a large platform, Seattle, that runs across uh, many different countries. Uh, Ramesh Kari who uh, uh, is at the forefront of the emerging area of uh, cybersecurity, and many more, Phyllis Frankel, Catherine Isbister, and, and so we have a very strong and talented group of faculty that make up our, our cybersecurity program. And it's just not just faculty, uh, we also work very closely with the administration. Uh, Bob Ubell here uh, has done phenomenal work in, in, in sort of building our online uh, cybersecurity program. In fact, uh, just yesterday we learned that the Sloan Foundation plans to give him the foremost honor uh, as the leader of online learning and uh, it's really great to, to have, uh, to be able to work with people like Bob and uh, also our president Jerry Halton, uh, he is also very passionate about security. He, when he was the Under Secretary of the Navy, he set up and he'll talk to you about it I guess, he set up the internet. Uh, uh, for and and where security was uh, was was a big concern. So so the passion for security sort of starts right at the top, and it's not just Jerry and Bob, but uh, we work closely with other administ administration, and uh, they the faculty and the administration together we've built uh, a very strong program. Our program is is uh, uh, sort of being an engineering school. It has a sort of hands-on. It's very hands-on focus. Uh, we were one of the earliest schools to be designated a national uh, center of excellence in, by the NSA in cybersecurity education as well as uh, research. Uh, we, were, we were one of the first schools to start cybersecurity programs and cybersecurity courses at the undergraduate level way back in 1999 when we were really not talking much about cybersecurity. We started a lab right in 1999 uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and over the 12 years uh, we've really grown to be a, a strong and sort of vibrant uh, program. After our affiliation with uh, uh, New York University, uh, we realized that uh, cybersecurity is not just about technology but there's more to it. Uh, uh, cybersecurity involves understanding business concerns, understanding human behavior concerns, cybersecurity deals with policy, and so we created this Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Security and Privacy, 
uh, that is a collaboration between NYU Poly, and uh, NYU Stern, NYU Courant, NYU Ste uh, Steinhardt, NYU Wagner, and we received funding from the National Science Foundation for about uh, 20 PhD students who would do research in cybersecurity, but they would also have a non-technical advisor, either from Stern or Steinhardt or Wagner, and uh, there are many of them in, in the audience, audience today. So, so we've grown to be sort of, uh, believe, one of the leading programs in, in cybersecurity in, in, in the nation. And of course, at the heart of the program, what really makes the program are the students. Uh, You've seen some of them. You've seen some of the research that uh, our students are, are doing outside. And if you haven't, please take time during the break to talk to them. Uh, and, and this research, it's not just research. This research doesn't come out of nowhere. It, it, it sort of, uh, it needs uh, an environment or a culture that the students have created. Uh, and uh, so, for example, our, our students uh, run a cybersecurity club, just completely student run. They, they have speakers come over uh, every week. Uh, this, this, the whole schedule for this semester is already filled up. Uh, we have a Friday hack night where students teach each other uh, how to the latest techniques. And, and, and all I do is buy, the, buy pizza for them and, and, and the, they do the rest. Uh, <laughs> uh, we even have hackers in residence uh, because we realize that uh, who, uh, celebrities in the white hat world like Dino, uh, Dino Daizoui and Dan Guido who come and regularly visit our labs and engage the students and work with faculty uh, to, uh, uh, and engage with them in, in projects and, and uh, get them uh, engaged in sort of later state of the art techniques and, and issues that, that are being faced by, by the industry. And uh, so, and, and another thing that we do is, is not just the environment, but we, uh, not just within poly, but we reach out to students all around the country. Uh, we organize something called the, for the last eight years, we've been, we've been organizing something called the Cybersecurity Awareness Week, which is Seesaw competition, which is a competition for students from all around the country. Uh, it has a bunch of events like Capture the Flag, High School Forensics Challenge, etc. cetera, uh, and where literally thousands of students take part, learn about security, get excited about security. Uh, just this year, the, the event will be in November, and we just opened registration for the Capture the Flag event, for example. And I'm told that within the first 45 minutes, more than 300 schools from around the country registered. Uh, we also have a high school forensics challenge, which, uh, we, which is open to students, students from all, uh, high school students from all around the country, and, and again, a few hundred schools, uh, teams from schools around the country compete. And, uh, in order to reach out, because one of the things you'll be hearing today is, is the big shortage of talent we have in cybersecurity, young people, and perhaps we're losing this battle right at the high school level. So we've made a great effort to reach out to students uh, in high schools around the country. Uh, we received funding from the National Science Foundation to get high school teachers, and we just concluded a boot camp a month back where we had uh, high school teachers, and we trained them in security, and then they go back and they mentor teams, and, and not just their school teams, but other schools in the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we also have created, with funding from NSA, a, a, a resource for high school students where they could learn about forensics, uh, uh, exchange uh, tools and ideas, and discuss with each other, teach each other. And we are trying hard to create this community of, of very talented students, not just at Poly, but, but around, around the country. Uh, one of the other uh, things we, we do is we, we've realized that uh, uh, if, if you look at the, the women in, in cybersecurity, it's typically it's about only 10% of cybersecurity professionals are women. And, and that's a shame because uh, we are missing out on 50% of the population. And so we've received funding from the National Security Agency again to hold a boot camp for high school uh, students, female students, uh, to come and spend a few weeks here in the summer next year at, at Poly uh, learning about security. We also have high school teachers who have uh, received training by us and they've promised to bring uh, all, all women teams to our seesaw challenges. Uh, so, 
So a lot of what we do is, is actually sort of the students who make it all happen and, and we work hard at, uh, and they have created the atmosphere and we want to, and we work hard at sort of reaching out to, towards the rest of the country and, and, and attracting students from, from all over to this discipline. They may not be at poly, but wherever they are, we want them to get interested in, in, in cybersecurity. So, so let me sort of stop there and, and thank you again. And if you're students in the audience, uh, please get involved in, in, uh, in Seesaw. Uh, if you're industry sponsors, uh, please help us run this, run this uh, great event that, that we have. And uh, uh, look forward to talking to you through the rest of the day. Thanks. Will the uh, students in the cybersecurity program and the faculty in the cybersecurity program all ra rise so that we can uh, acknowledge you? Please stand. Uh, one of the uh, problems with the online learning program is that we cannot ask them to stand uh, in this audience. Uh, many of you may know that uh, the online program of cybersecurity as well as other programs that we have here at NYU Poly have students from all over the world. Uh, especially there's one group uh, in Bangalore who are employees of uh, uh, one of our major banks here, Goldman Sachs, and they take this program all the way from India uh, and receive exactly the same program that uh, students at, on campus receive. So uh, if you're watching on the internet, our students uh, in, Abu, in uh, India or uh, China or elsewhere, uh, please rise and we can give you a... Uh, the next person's already uh, been identified by Professor Memon is our president, uh, Jerry Holton who uh, has been a strong and uh, effective supporter for cybersecurity and other major programs that we have here at Poly. Uh, Jerry Holton uh, has had a long and distinguished career as a uh, politician, as a uh, senior officer at the uh, Department of Defense, as Undersecretary of, of the Navy. Uh, in academic life as uh, the chairman of the department, uh, or the dean, I think, of the Department of Management at Stevens Institute of Technology, where I first met him, and uh, now as president of NYU Poly, who is responsible for the alliance that we have with NYU. I'll introduce you to Jerry Holton. So thank you, Bob and Nasser, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, New York University's Polytechnic Institute. So you know, the nice thing about having a cybersecurity program is that I got to read all your emails this morning. So I kind of have a feeling for your mood and uh, what's going on. So uh, there's a couple of you I need to talk to afterwards. But short of that, uh, and did I hear Nasser say that I invented the internet? I think that was, that was Al Gore, that was not me. But I had a hand in the Navy Marine Corps corporate intranet, which was a pretty massive network. But, uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about NYU Poly, set the stage, and then also introduce our uh, first speaker, who is uh, really, it's quite an honor to have uh, Deborah Plunkett here. But first, let me just say a bit. Engineering and science, applied science especially, uh, has played a key role in the whole industrial revolution. You don't need to tell that story over again, right? But the future is somewhat different. An engineer in a 1950s assignment said, build a power plant, but no one said, figure out whether it's clean. But there's no student today who I could give an assignment like, build a power system, who wouldn't look at me and say, but is it going to be a clean power system? So engineering's moved out to saying, what happens in society is important. And young people come to me more and more today and say, two things I want to do. I want to get a good job. I want to lead a good life. But two, I want to build a better world. That second piece 
probably existed in the 50s, but it's got a kind of resonance now. So we have a young student who's working in Africa. We've got students that have found a new way to take concrete and build houses in Haiti with a faculty member teamed up that withstand an earthquake. So you can see the shift taking place. And we call all of that uh, I squared E for invention, innovation. Thank you. I always like the construction crew that's uh, there's a code there, I'm sure. It's trapped. <laughs> it's one of your cyber students say, trying to get in, right? So, so uh, yeah, it's I squared E. Get back on track here. I squared E, invention, innovation, entrepreneurship. So we have a business, two business incubators with over 50 companies. We've raised over $45 million in the last three years for these companies, mainly to give our students a taste of what it means to take risk. Whether it's cybersecurity, big data, bioinformatics, the future of cities with this new city project that we're doing with the mayor, it's all quite exciting and uh, really does change young lives. You can feel the difference in our students. Our students, now that we're part of NYU, we've always had a little a, a competition for inventing things. And the prize at the end of Polly's contest was $5,000, not a bad prize. But we join NYU, and NYU has a competition for new business ideas, top prize is 75,000. So good poly students, they compete, chunk, 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 work their way right to the top and win NYU's top prize. So now you're turning heads. When a young student can win a $75,000 prize, it makes a difference. And we have this new university we're building in Abu Dhabi, and there the students competed for the million dollar called HULT Prize, not my name, H-U-L-T. And it's mainly graduate student teams compete. We created an undergraduate team. One of my favorite faculty members, Ramesh Jagannathan. This team went on to win the World Prize, $330,000, and Bill Clinton gave him the award uh, at the grand finale of that. So you can see how this is changing young people's lives. And it means that if you hire them, they have an energy that is just delightful. Uh, if they're doing research, they're doing great work. So let's talk now about, uh, get to the heart of what we're here to hear about, and let's talk a little bit about our first speaker, uh, Deborah Plunkett. She's the Director of Information Assurance at NSA. NSA, at least we say the words these days, but we don't say a lot, uh, because it has such an important role, but it's so critical that a, a good bit of it is behind the curtain of being classified. As undersecretary, I got to see some of that, but uh, you only see what you're supposed to see and what you need to know, as Deborah will tell you. But think of this, this is essentially the agency that uh, assures that all the critical infrastructure that carries information is safe. That's quite a daunting assignment. And we can think of all the standard things, I'm sure Deborah will go into this, that we worried about, but we we're just talking before uh, this uh, event about hospitals and how p vulnerable hospitals are, for instance, to cyber attack and how much is going on in a hospital that if it was attacked is life-threatening. So you can see more and more that the domain that we're worried about, and the agency may not be the only one to worry about that, but certainly universities are going to spread their domain of what they're trying to protect more and more. So the head of NSA says attacks uh, in the USA have gone up 17-fold uh, since 2009. Now, I remember what the tax were like in 99 and 2000 when I was undersecretary, and they were far more massive than the nation knew. But if 17-fold from 2009, this is truly significant. He then evaluated how ready we were to handle these attacks and said on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, we're about three. This is not good news. This is, though, job security for every student in cybersecurity. <laughs> so you're going to be needed. Don't worry. So let's think about Deborah's role in this, a key player in ensuring that there is security in our information system, now working more and more with universities and corporations to be sure they're all engaged in this. And so today we're going to have bankers, consulting firms, defense firms all talking to you about what they're doing. This is essentially what Deborah's doing is saying, you all got to be in this together. There's a second reason you ought to
take note of Deborah, and that is, I think Bob and Nasser both alluded to this, in the cybersecurity arena, the data says about 13% are women. This is one of the women leaders right here. She's a role model for students across the nation. And we have made women in cybersecurity one of our emphasis. We're working with the NSF and CUNY to create a whole new program so that women will care about being in cybersecurity. There's no reason why those numbers shouldn't be 50-50, and it would be good because there's a lot of brain power. Go back and read the history of World War II, the number of women that played such critical roles in cryptography and computers. Uh, we need that brain power. So it's good to have you here for two reasons, protecting our security and the role of women. Finally, I think uh, whether you're a man or a woman, take a little note of her career. This is a person who has done smart, theoretical, scientific thinking. She's also done hands-on real work. She knows how to manage people. This combination is the essence of what you need when you rise to the top of an agency like NSA. So it's a uh, great testimony to her skills and brain power, but also a real good role model for how you see the future. So let me just tell you briefly, uh, how she got here in terms of education, a degree from uh, Towson University in uh, Natural Science, an MBA from Johns Hopkins, an MS in National Security from the National War College, uh, advanced uh, scholarship including study at Harvard Law School's uh, Conflict Management Program and NSA's Management Education Program. Uh, she holds the NSA leadership uh, position that includes signals intelligence and information security. She's a director, she was a director of the Security Council at the White House under both uh, President Clinton, who I served with, and President Bush, helping shape critical infrastructure. And she was awarded by President Bush the Meritorious Executive in the Senior Cryptologic Executive Service, a very unique and new set of, of our stars. So this is a career that you can all try to emulate. I hope you will. And uh, great to have you here to talk about what is on the nation's mind more and more, which is defending cyberspace. Are we ready? Uh, Deborah, Director Plunkett, it is great to have you here, and all of you, enjoy the day. routine technology. One is by <clears throat> emailing your questions to cyber lecture series right. at poly.edu, or you can Twitter uh, using the tweet at cyber lecture. Please. Deborah. Great. Good morning, everybody. It is really my great pleasure to be here. Thank you to President Holton, to the staff and faculty here at NYU Poly. Um, it is just a great honor um, to be able to spend uh, this morning with you especially in this age where we are talking a lot about cyber and cybersecurity. It is one of the topics that resonates with me on a daily basis, whether I am at work or at play. And I'll talk about that some uh, throughout the, the time here with you today. We've got to get my slides up. So um, I'm, going to I'm going to spend a little time today with you talking about, next slide, talk a little bit about the current environment, um, talk about why it's important for us to care about the current environment, environment. A question that I am asked quite often in fora like this is what keeps me up at night. So I'm going to start off answering that question. Um, and, then, and then the time has come, and then I'll spend some time talking about threats and emerging threats in the environment and some uh, recommendations that I would have on things we should think about um, as we look at how to be able to mitigate against them. So what's the current environment look like? Um, you can't open today's newspapers without seeing some uh, in entity, some infrastructure that has been uh, infiltrated by some malicious behavior uh, almost on a daily basis now. And we're not just talking about small companies. We're talking about big companies. And by the way, those are just the ones you hear about. Um, there are many, many, many that I'd posit that we don't get to hear about for a variety of different reasons. 
The environment is also such that we are tremendously dependent on technology for our livelihood. How many people have a piece of technology with them today? All of our hands are going to go up, right? Um, and when I travel um, away from my workplace, um, I can have up to five different mobile devices with me for the many different types of communication. That's a whole other briefing and a whole other problem because it really shouldn't be five. And we're working hard to reduce that number. Um, but I can't live without it. I'm constantly got something in my hand when I'm outside of the workplace and inside the workplace. I'm constantly touching different pieces of technology to stay connected and stay, to stay informed. So we've got a world that's critically dependent on technology. We've got bad guys who would want to do us harm for a variety of different reasons that I'll talk about. And so what keeps me up at night? So this is probably the appropriate time to get in the one dig I need to get in. So what was probably not in my, in my bio is that I'm a lifelong Baltimorean. And what's probably also not in my bio is that I was a junior Oriole. So what did not keep me up last night was the score of that game. Go birds. OK, I'm done. I've now got, got it off my chest. 10 to 6 if anybody didn't get to come back from the, yes, OK. Um, so what's my role uh, in, in this cyberspace, information assurance space? Uh, at NSA, we are responsible for protecting and defending national security systems. And as President Holton talked about, we also provide significant support in assisting key partners like the Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, partnering with them to provide our expertise and our technical assistance as they serve in their roles in the areas of uh, working with critical infrastructure sectors to help them understand and then better protect um, their infrastructures. And why do we care? Uh, we care because as a nation, from a US government perspective, the vast majority of the infrastructure that we rely on in order for us to conduct the business of government is owned and operated by private industry. So we have a vested interest in making sure that those infrastructures are as secure as they can be. What keeps me up at night? Uh, honestly, two things. Uh, one is that I have a workforce that's very tired. Workforce is really tired um, because, you know, this is the heyday, this is the golden age of information assurance and cybersecurity. And that means that we have much more business than we could ever want or, or, or uh, comfortably take care of, uh, many more requirements than we can handle, and we are ever dedicated and committed uh, to be able to do our part to help combat some of the significant challenges we find in that space. So I need fresh legs, I need, and I see lots of them here in the room, and hopefully folks that are listening afar who want to look at an opportunity, um, certainly at NSA we'd welcome, absolutely, but not just NSA, all over the government, all over private sector. We have a need for professionals who are able to think and to act and to help us to create solutions to some of the tough challenges that we see in the cybersecurity space. So what keeps me up at night is how can I make sure that my workforce stays refreshed and is able to get some time off and come back refreshed and renewed but also that we can stay on top of the critical problems that the nation has entrusted with us. The other thing that keeps me up at night uh, is that we don't know what we don't know. And so every single day I come in uh, knowing that I have no idea what kind of new problem is going to come my way, um, that I have no sense of the vulnerability we might find that day or the new threat that might come that might cause us to have to think in some different ways, um, to act much more quickly than we have historically been accustomed to, to make tough decisions about investments, um, both in capabilities today and investments in what we might need in the future. And so those are the two things that really keep me thinking uh, and wanting to be in environments like this where I am confident that uh, as we band together industry and government and academia, uh, we can solve some of these tough problems. So really the time has come for us as a community to stand up strong and, um, and be committed and united and really open in our commitments together to be able to combat some of these really tough challenges. So my responsibilities in information assurance are the national security systems specifically. Those are the authorities that were, uh, are given to NSA um, by the president and that's specifically defined as, uh, syst as classified networks and systems, as well as those that might be used for military or intelligence operations. 
Um, so I'm responsible for, my organization responsible for developing and delivering solutions that can assure the communications that ride in a, various, a variety of different means across a number of different networks and environments. Um, we train and develop um, others uh, across the government to be able to do the type of work that we do so that we can expand our capabilities across the government. So we have things called blue teams that go out and do assessments on the networks and environments of U.S. government entities. We have red teams that, are, that sit back and figure out crafty ways that they can, with the permission of the system and network owner, um, get into those systems, not to demonstrate that we can, but to demonstrate that there's a measure of security that is not in place that needs to be in place. And we provide that assistance uh, literally around the globe. We have folks that are positioned around the globe to be able to provide that support to U.S. government um, customers and entities. Um, we have a significant role in what we call operational security, OPSEC. Um, that means just being aware that when you are communicating on what you're communicating, and if you're, if you're communicating something that uh, needs to be protected, that you're communicating in a way that actually protects those communications. So we have a significant effort and investment in operational security, but in information assurance overall. So NYU Poly, a center of academic excellence with us, um, and, in, and uh, about 140 other colleges and universities. Dr. Malt, Mark Althaus here with me today, um, works on our staff and is our senior executive account leader for the NYU Poly relationship. Uh, Mark also works in our mobility area and he really, any questions on anything I have to say, you should ask Mark. He would be the right person to check into. <laughs> Next slide. So what's the current state? Where do we currently stand? Let's see, to get a true uh, understanding of the magnitude of the problem that we face, think about how many pieces of technology um, you rely on on a daily basis just to live, to work, to play, uh, to be in school. Most families um, have multiple computers, and, and some of the things we don't even think about in the context of relying on technology, but you know, my refrigerator probably has more computer chips in it you know, than, my, uh, than the smart, smartphone or uh, tablet that I walk around with. And, and that is just growing in magnitude. In fact, by 2015, it is anticipated that there will be twice as many internet devices as there are people in the world by 2015. That is not so far away. Any device you own provides you great capabilities, um, but if you think about it from the perspective of the bad guy, it provides yet another attack surface, another mechanism by which to get into your environment, to get information that might be of value to you, and to use it uh, to no good cause. So it's really clear for us that times are very much changing. Consumers are embracing mobile devices and solutions to perform many, many, many time-saving tasks. A couple of statistics. In 2010, Internet commerce accounted for $684 billion, or 4.7% of all U.S. economic activity, and this number is growing. In five years, AT&T mobile data increased by 20,000%. Cisco projects mobile traffic will increase 18-fold between 2011 and 2016. In 2011, there were 461 mobile phones and tablets sold worldwide, and according to one research firm, there, were over, there was over 400 petabytes a month in, in mobile traffic during just the fourth quarter of 2011. That, that, that seems astonishing, really, when we think about where we were even 10 years ago when I sat uh, at the White House National Security Council during cyber, doing cybersecurity um, policy. And by the way, back then, we were talking about something called the I Love You virus, which some of you may remember or have heard about. And the big targets were academic institutions, big targets. Today, academic institutions were main targets, but um, easy targets. Um, the, the, the bad news, the sad news, is uh, many, many of the target, many, many of the uh, attacks now are, go are going against some of the targets that we have historically not viewed as easy targets, and they are being successful. So the unfortunate truth is that uh, the many applications that we need and we rely on for our livelihood um, are introduced in the infrastructure, and with them come some goodies, some bad, some mad, some malware that we often don't even know. We don't even know. I can't tell you how many times my, smart, my smartphone is updated in a given day. 
it's invisible to me. And I'm trusting that the, um, the, the service provider of my smartphone has put in place all the right security measures to make sure only the things that need to be there are there, but I don't know that, and, and you don't know it either. In the past 18 months, we have seen um, multiple intrusions into networks and infrastructures. I'm going to give you just a running list. October two, 2010, NASDAQ, very close to home here. In March of 2011, RSA. In April of, of uh, 2011, level three. May 2011 was a banner month for the bad guys. Sony, Citigroup, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. In June 2011, there was Google. These are all, by the way, publicly announced and available, because I wouldn't tell you anything else. In July of 2011, Booz Allen Hamilton. August 2011, Diginotar. September 2011, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. October. Sony, November, Adidas, December, Visa, and the Chamber of Commerce, January 2012, Symantec. I could go on and on. Right? And if you think about those industries and those companies, these were not small companies. Significant, um, heavy players in a number of areas that are critical to us. And they themselves were experiencing um, intrusions into their, uh, into their systems and networks. So I think we all can believe that, in, in many of these instances, by the way, these, some of these companies were and remain the best in the business from a security perspective. Uh, and so what that says is that the bar has been raised as it relates to adversary capabilities and intentions. Um, they're getting much better. They're getting much craftier. They're able to move in a much quieter way. Uh, and so we have to be ever more vigilant. And I've already stated that universities are not exempt. And while much of the work that happens in universities um, by design is to be collaborative and open and sharing, um, I, I bet, I'll bet that there is information even in the university networks that's worth protecting. So it's even more important that, uh, and than ever that even universities are protecting those, those uh, critical pieces of information. So why is the threat growing? You think back to the 1980s when um, personal computers were a hobby, um, then PC viruses were a hobby, um, but the, and back then mainframes were under some attack, um, and those systems were being looked at pretty seriously because of the criticality of mainframes to our livelihood. So from a, the malicious and exploitative side of computing um, and, the, and the internet have really grown in their reliance on it from a social and commercial, and especially from my perspective, a national security perspective. If you think about industry can put out a new mobile device um, about every nine months, I know, because I have two now young adult kids who wanted to swap out their phones regularly. Um, and although business and personal networks may appear secure now, the level and effectiveness of security measures has to be questioned and evaluated on a daily basis, even if you think you're secure right this minute. And in fact, even if you are, you really don't know what change in the technology and environment or change in adversary behavior might cause you to be not secure um, in the very next hour. So the hard truth is that the more technology we use, the more we need to protect it. Some estimates are that a million new samples of malware are detected every month. And the sophistication, as I've stated, of the malware is growing exponentially, while the life cycle is rapidly decreasing, uh, which means it's harder and harder to be able to track emerging malware and to prevent attacks. So why is the threat growing? Because the more technology we use, um, the more we need to protect it. It's really a fairly simple equation. Um, the more opportunity, the more reliance we have on technology, the more opportunity there is for those that would want to take advantage of it um, and, and to be able to do so. And you know, we, have, we see increased investments um, by malicious actors in honing their skills and capabilities um, and actually demonstrating some in, in test environments, but many, many, many in real environments. So today I want to talk a little bit about emerging threats really as the core of my talk, um, to talk about what is an emerging threat, and I'm going to characterize it in this context uh, as a new technology. I'm going to look at it from a technology perspective and from the perspective of adversary behavior. And I'm going to give you some challenges 
give you some of my thinking on what are some things we can do to address some of those challenges. Hopefully leave you with some uh, good things to think about as those of you who are in the field or have opportunities to think about it in the academic environment, but also those of you that are looking to move out of the academic environment, environment into the workplace will have a sense of the kind of challenges we're looking at today and the opportunities that I think will exist for you as you are moving out of this institution and into the, wor into the work world. So why should we study emerging threats? Uh, for me, the bottom line is that um, I need to get out of what uh, General Alexander, the director of NSA, characterizes as cleanup on aisle nine. And so though that very simply means a bad thing has happened, and now we're just trying to clean it up. And so my task is to get beyond cleanup in aisle nine and get to the point where we can actually anticipate before that spill happens and be able to stop it from happening in advance. And by the way, all along the way, being able to assure to the customers and the clients who rely on me to be able to communicate safely, be able to assure them that they can continue to do so, even in light of or in spite of um, adversary attacks against them. Um, another reason to look at it is to be able to identify um, adversary tradecraft. We learn a whole lot by watching the behaviors of of internet adversaries, bad guys who move around and try to do bad things. We learn a lot about techniques and tactics. We learn a lot about profiles. And we can use that body of information to help us develop uh, defensive measures that posture us as a nation to be better prepared to address them. And so who are the stakeholders? Um, it's really all of us. I mean, I, I have a list, but it's, I, I don't need to read through a list. It's anybody who has a reliance on networks and communications. We all have a stake in having some level of assurance as a nation and really as a global body um, that we can continue to operate safely. We all deserve it. Uh, we ought to be standing up strong and demanding it. And we ought to be supporting and working together as a unit to ensure that we can have it. So in the context of emerging threats, I'm going to talk about, um, um, you can hit the next. I'm going to talk about the threats that fall into to, uh, one of uh, or both categories. We have these technological threats and behavioral that I just talked to you. From a technological perspective, I'm speaking specifically of um, those threats that are driven by um, either an evolving or new or anticipated or existing technology to include everything that surrounds that technology, the standards, the protocols um, from a hardware and a software perspective. Then on, on the behavioral side, um, looking specifically at threats that are driven by changes in behaviors, whether it be tactics or intentions or capabilities, um, looking at the practices, looking at the operating norms, um, and then look at, looking at regulatory regimes, which there are not very many in cyberspace, right? Because the beauty of cyberspace for many is that it provides an anonymity. Um, and so the need for laws and rules uh, certainly from the perspective of those that might want to do harm, it's just, uh, it's not there, right? Because they can hide, they believe they can hide in plain sight. So I'll talk about technological threats first, then I'll talk a little bit about behavioral threats. First one on the technological threat side is customized malware and attacks make what we have characteristically used as a, a very common way to mitigate against malware, blacklisting, uh, and signature detection as a component of any uh, detection, intrusion detection capability, makes it much less effective for us. So um, we expect to see much more on the fly, custom generated malware. We're seeing it already. And what do we do to be able to respond? What can we possibly do? Uh, reputation services are one way, we think, that can provide some help. Um, we'll be able to, over time, get more sophisticated, a new, not a new capability, a capability we are um, most recently widely deploying in the US, US government spaces is federated white, whitelisting services. Um, but also, and, and it's come, really come very much into prominent use. Uh, we're already seeing some use in corporations um, and in, certainly in government environments, and we expect this to come much more widespread. Trust foundations, we think, can help over the long term, but that takes time and commitment uh, and investment in order to be able to uh, successfully implement them and sustain them over time. So the next 
Technological threat I'll talk about a little bit is this internet of things. Um, think about it. Um, these non-person entities on the internet. We've got cars on the internet now. We've got all kinds of control systems, sensors, medical devices. Uh, and as we look at these entities um, on the internet joining that, we have the potential to see much greater um, uh, attacks, many more attacks being conducted that ultimately affect the physical world. Um, these gizmos, by the way, provide easy avenues for access because many of them are not secured and there is little incentive to many of the manufacturers to have to secure them. A really popular device um, that I see in use a lot now, and I, um, I use one but not the one I'm going to describe, is a pedometer. You think pedometer, that's easy, put a pedometer on, it's a little simple device, tracks, tracks your steps. Um, but there are many pedometers on the market today um, that are, have wireless capability. You can download information onto your computer, you can download to some remote service that can give you lots of cool data and statistics on how, how, how your walk's doing, can, you know, beep you with some incentives to take a couple more steps, take the staircase instead of walking. You think that, you know, that's how, how dangerous can a pedometer be? Well, it's got to, it, if it has the capability to be able to store data, has capability to be able to transmit, um, then it presents an opportunity uh, for someone who would want to gain access to some environment. So the response for us, and my recommendation is that we would incentivize um, security. So think about it. Um, from a current space, when you are trying to uh, use electrical appliances, the underwriter's laboratory requires that you get this UL rating in order to be able to, and you know, you're, you can't even buy an electrical device now on the market, or not legally at least, without having an underwriter's laboratory rating. Um, the Federal, Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, um, certifies aircraft. So aircraft can't go up unless they've had their FAA certifications. Federal, um, the Food and Drug Administration um, approves the use of medical devices and as well as medical products for use. Maybe we should be looking at borrowing from that system in practice where that, whereby gadgets that sit on the net um, need some kind of resilience validation um, to provide some assurances such as in the, this physical world, this kind of thing really has been driven by government regulation, insurance industry requirements are both. Um, I would propose that there may be some space to begin thinking about some type of resiliency re regulation for this internet of things, the things that reside on the internet. Some level of assurance that there's been some type of look from a security perspective um, at, the, at, the, at the soundness and hardening um, of, those, of those devices. And then the second thought really is simplification. You know, how, you know, how complicated does my refrigerator really need to be? Um, how many different buttons do I really need on the outside? But not just simplification in, from a user pers perspective, perhaps also from a perspective of protocols, simplified protocols for the internet connected things, and then stringent validations for them. That would give us a fighting chance again of knowing what's on the net and having a level of assurance that what's out there um, has, a, has a, a purpose and is not being misused in any way. I couldn't not talk about technology and uh, I couldn't talk about technology and not talk about IPv6. What is it? It's the next generation of protocol for the internet. Um, it is how we, how data is the protocol is used to send data uh, from one computer to another. And it contains, th contains things like addressing um, information, control information in order to be able to route packets. Why are we moving there? Quite simply, because we're getting full. Right, so we need more space on the internet, uh, and so we, and we also, by the way, can take advantage of IPv6 because we think we'll be able to have more efficient routing, more support for lots of mobile devices that exist in that environment, but there are challenges. And so from a threat perspective, um, again, it's a new attack surface. It's a new attack vector. Um, exploitation, stealth, all the things that you see listed there. And one of the biggest challenges for us, I believe, is that we generally don't have a community that is well informed and trained in defensive measures as it relates to IPv6. So we've got an effort back at NSA, 
where we've uh, developed some training, training modules. Uh, we're working with our defensive folks, help get them up to speed on what, needs to, what they need to understand and what needs to be in place. We are thinking about IPv6 from a security perspective, um, but there is a lot, a lot of work to be done. And I would really hope that places like this are taking a look at that as an opportunity. Ding, ding. Um, so responses, very simple. Training for defenders and IT operators. Um, co getting coverage of IPv6, especially from a defensive perspective in colleges and universities. And then being very careful and selective in introducing um, IPv IPv6 enabled capabilities into enterprise operations. Um, you can't just do it all at once. You want to be able to test as you go to make sure the implementation is as secure as it can be. So my, uh, one of the biggest requirements that I have in my role as the Information Assurance Director is to be able to, um, to provide secure mobile capabilities for classified information. That would be to be able to use a smartphone and a tablet uh, for, for those uh, customers who have a requirement. Um, to have access to classified information. You wouldn't think it would be so hard, but it is really, really, really hard for a variety of different reasons. So we're in the middle now of a pilot where we're testing a smartphone, a closed network uh, with, for classified data, and uh, tape data and voice, uh, and working with the Defense Information Systems Agency for the rollout of a limited enterprise capability uh, by the end of this year. But mobility presents for us not just huge uh, opportunities from a mission perspective to just be able to work more effectively, but tremendous threats. Uh, we're seeing more and more malware and mobile platform attacks um, and, uh, over the past couple of years. And the use of uh, mobile platforms really as an attack service, surface, we're hearing things, terms like uh, the consumerization of IT. And that really is driving the heavy use of mobile devices as an enabler, a mission enabler and also creating that new platform for uh, adversaries. So the response, um, taking a hard look at core security functionality, um, not looking at um, mobility as only about the device that sits in your hand. It really is connected to an infrastructure, and the entire infrastructure has to be looked at hard to ensure that every part of it um, provides the best opportunity and you take advantage of the best opportunity for security. Some of the things we care about a lot in that secure mobility space is um, data at rest protections. Um, uh, very, very important for us. If you think about the clientele that we serve, um, many of whom we're going to have these mobile devices, not just in um, places like New York and Washington, but also in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And I need to be able to provide a new level of assurance to those customers that the information that they have on their devices is protected and that they're able to operate safely and securely in the missions that they have. Um, the, our our uh, thrust in the mobility space, specifically in response to that, um, is to look at using the cloud and virtualization as a mechanism so we can remove as much as we can from the end device and put it in a place that makes it accessible no matter where you are. But most importantly, if I use that device, if I lose that device, uh, or someone, it gets into hands of someone who doesn't, um, doesn't deserve it, then I can cut it off and we can keep moving and I can get another one and I can still get access to my stuff and be able to do the work that I need. Mobile device management, critically important. Back to that, uh, my cell phone is updated multiple times a day and I don't know about it. Uh, well, here's, this, here's the secret. If it's got classified data on it, um, I have to know about it because if I don't, I might be coming to look for a job around here. So I've got I, I to gotta know about it, uh, which means I've got to have some control over that, um, over that device, over, over what goes into it, what comes out of it, what's connected to it. Uh, and so we're looking at looking for innovative ways to help us in the area of mobile device management. Um, the secure communications based on standards is critically important. We are advocating for open, the use of open standards, by the way. Uh, because using open standards that are available for anyone who wants to play in this environment um, gives us many more opportunities, gives industry many more opportunities to play. Proprietary standards um, don't provide that opportunity. It limits us to one place, one vendor, one, one type of solution. Uh, we want to be able to make as many solutions as we can available to as many who need, as need it 
I'd like to be able to put a, uh, a menu of items before customers say, if you like this operating system, we can make that happen. If you like the other, we can make it happen. Um, but that requires uh, some cooperation. Uh, that is happening, by the way, across industry and government in order for us to get there. So now on to the, to the behavioral threats. Um, Faster pace as a threat. Well, you might think, what, what in the world could that possibly mean? So malware is being developed at a pace uh, faster than ever before. Um, everything really in this malicious space is moving much more quickly. Uh, we're already seeing things like geographically distributed coordination of malicious attacks across the globe. Um, and we are looking for much more of that to happen over time. And, the, and ultimately the entire life cycle from the discovery of a vulnerability to the exploitation of that vulnerability by the adversary has significantly decreased. That means we've got to be on our, on, our, uh, on our game all the time. We don't have time on our hands as it relates to finding a vulnerability and then developing a mitigation and deploying it before someone actually decides to use it to their advantage. So the response then, uh, increased automation, that's, the, that's a no-brainer, right? We need to get the humans out of the picture as much as possible as it relates to in the decision cycle of determining an action that needs to be taken. We use terms like cyber time and cyberspace. We need to be able to see a bad thing happen and uh, make the appropriate decision and action consistent with our laws and authorities in order to protect the information that's critically important to us. So we're working hard on that automation space, but there is a lot more work to be done to automate everything from continuous monitoring, being able to look constantly and recognize, uh, have the right profiles in place to be able to recognize when bad acts and activities come, come our way, to be able to put response actions in place as appropriate. Uh, we have to be able to use hardened, layered architectures to slow the attack. So here's the scenario. Uh, from my, my side of the business, we look at it in sort of three stages. The first is we are very much focused on hardening the infrastructure as much as we can. When I say the word hardening, um, I mean applying known solutions to known vulner vulnerabilities. You might think that's easy. We kind of think it is. But it's really not so easy to implement uh, because it costs because there are decisions that have to be made in the decision cycle of IT professionals and senior managers about what to invest in next. Um, but our firm belief is that if we're able to harden to the hilt, harden as much as we can based on what we know about vulnerabilities that exist in a given environment, that we can mitigate about 80% of the bad behaviors that are going on the internet just simply by hardening. But there's still that 20% that we worry about a whole lot. That's a keep me up at night, kind of 20%. And so we don't rely solely on the hardening as sufficient enough to protect us. We then do deploy sensors inside and outside of our environments, regularly looking, that's that continuous monitoring piece, regularly looking to see if there's any behaviors that are coming our way that don't belong or that are there that don't belong. Um, and then we want to leverage all elements of national power um, to include working across government and industry and academia um, to make sure that we're collaborating, cooperating in the best ways possible in order to be able to have the best chance of keeping our networks and infrastructures as safe as they can be. So in this context of hardened, layered architecture, we believe we can actually do this, by the way, with uh, commer using commercial products and solutions, commercial solutions for classified end-to-end -end, uh, with vendor diversity, um, layering commercial products that comprise a given architecture or network construct. Um, while each one of those components likely to have some vulnerability, um, and we expect that, the vulnerability may exist unintentionally, more likely than not, sometimes intentionally. But if we can layer those components in the right way, we think we can largely mitigate against the vast majority of the vulnerabilities. So using that, our hardened architecture, critically important. And then standardizing defensive information exchange. Um, we, have, uh, we are working on and have worked with some time with the National Institutes of Standards and many government and industry partners um, in the development of and use of Security Content Automation Protocols, SCAP, um, a language that allows defensive or components of an enterprise to be able to exchange information between them in a common language so that that information coming to my, my, my component 
um, is useful for me at the time that it's received because it's in a common language. We stood up a lab actually last October, partnership with industry, um, called the Trusted Network uh, Connections Center, SCAP Demonstration Center, to actually bring industry and government together to be able to look at and test um, different capabilities in the standard space because it's so critically important that we can get those multiple components in the enterprise talking to each other in the same language. In the behavioral space, uh, the next place I'd like to talk about is, uh, is life cycle scope. So the, the supply chain or the introduction of malicious functionality, backdoor access, triggered disruptions as a result of supply chain. You know, this can be done, it, it can happen at multiple places in the development cycle. It can happen at the point of development. Um, it can happen as uh, packaging is, hap is uh, being implemented. By the way, it can even happen after the product gets to a place that you might think would be safe, like on the shelf. Um, so there are multiple, and then let's not even, you know, you know, that we haven't even mentioned the fact that it can happen once you buy it and begin to use it or install it in a given infrastructure. So there are many points that the supply chain um, can, be can be introduced. So we've always, already seen sporadic examples of this, uh, mostly limited uh, to the areas of software development and distribution channels. But this is, a, this is really an example of where, we, um, where attackers are generally seeking to push compromise um, or access further back in the life cycle, cycle further and further back in the life cycle. Um, the, this, is, this is a difficult problem, um, admittedly a really difficult problem for us. Uh, it'll be a tremendous effort for us to be able to, and, and I would dare say an impossible effort, for us to have a level of security as it relates to every single component that we might use um, in any system. Uh, it would, it, I, I don't believe it can be done, and that's not where we should be putting our trust and confidence. Um, that said, there's lots of efforts underway in the research arena, in um, hardware and software reverse engineering, um, to help understand how we might be able to better employ some capabilities in those spaces. Um, there's a greater, uh, the greater use of signed software, so as a solution space, Having the software sign, we believe, is critically important. We are strongly advocating for soft signware, software signing. And in the hardware space, still in the research stage, um, but there is some benefit, and we see specifically some benefit in the area of anti-counterfeiting efforts. And then I already talked to you about um, the layered solutions piece. My personal prediction, supply chain assurance will become a means for suppliers to differentiate um, to differentiate or distinguish themselves, and that suppliers in some sectors will have to implement certain best practices in order to be competitive. And uh, we look forward to seeing that. Another behavioral threat in the area of application focus. So the emerging threat, or at least a threat trend, um, is attacks focusing on application software. Um, currently on servers and workstations, we're starting to see it in the mobility space now, more and more later. Uh, many third-party and independent application developers, um, we believe, don't have the resources um, or the, work, the wherewithal or, either, or the intent um, to be able to spend on what is needed to reduce vulnerabilities that many of the major platform defenders do. So vulnerability in apps are easy. We have apps developed, some of you probably here in the room have developed apps, um, and even though the major um, distributors and the warehouses and libraries and org entities that own the apps markets and manage them, um, they all have criteria to be able to gain entry, um, but we're not confident that that criteria includes the security threshold that we would be most comfortable with. So the response then is um, we need to make it easier for developers to write secure apps. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that means raising the bar on security. It means education and training. It means investing in um, those that are, that are developing apps and making it easy. You know, I'd love to see, uh, you know, don't quote me on this, well, you probably will, you know, intro to, you know, app development as a gen ed requirement from a security perspective for all students coming into colleges and universities, some level of computer security 101, um, just to begin to plant the seed 
for that um, awareness uh, and culture of security that we really need to permeate uh, our entire world. And we need to make it harder for compromised apps uh, to inflict harm across an entire platform. Uh, and so, you know, in my space, the solution is fairly easy. Um, I'm going to control the apps that come into the space that I'm responsible for. That gets to the mobile device management piece, but everybody can't do that. And so we need some standards and some norms um, that are just uh, required for uh, applications, application developers, and application users, and those that would make them available to us as a public so that you all, we all can have a greater level of assurance that what we're using has gone through some level of rigor from a security perspective. You think about what you do on your mobile devices, your not, you know, your, certainly your personally identifiable information, your financial information, and all subject to an application, the origin of which you don't know. Don't, know, don't really know what you downloaded, what you really got. Um, on the counter-attack culture, um, there is, uh, this is really the belief by some organizations or individuals that counter-attacking is a viable response to a cyber intrusion. Why is this dangerous? Um, the chances of useful, useful behavior changes really are pretty small. Um, the chance of serious unintended consequences is pretty high. Uh, and the counter, the counter attack is essentially never really a viable response, in my view, for an individual target. Um, there are also consequences, um, some of which we are just beginning to explore in the context of what's, uh, what's acceptable in cyberspace. What are the norms? Are there international norms? And should, or should there be for acceptable behavior in cyberspace? So the response for us, we think, is education. Um, attribution is difficult, by the way, and that gets to the anonymity that the internet provides. Um, education about liability issues, certainly clearer um, laws and international norms, and then most importantly, those partnerships so that we can have a trust factor across sectors, those of us that are dependent on products and services, and those are that, are, that are developing and delivering them. Nation state actors, um, nation state actors, and when I specifically speak of nation state actors, I'm talking about those that have a level of sophistication that far exceeds somebody in their garage, you know, playing around and trying to do something bad on the internet. These uh, many nation state actors today, emerging capabilities, um, significant capabilities, sophisticated capabilities, growing in speed and volume and capability and intent against a broad spectrum of, of uh, historically non-traditional um, targets. And so while these you know, nations have engaged in espionage forever, really, many, many, many years, uh, we're starting to see nation state resources and expertise employed in what we would characterize as reckless and disruptive, um, destructive behaviors. Um, if you recall back during the, during the Cold War, blocks of nations worked against each other. We know the history of that. Um, but there was a sense of rules and restraint, even in that space, even between rival organizations or nations. Um, some of today's national cyber actors don't seem to be bound by any sense of restraint. Um, no recognition of respect or norms or interest in that. And those responsible are clearly working against, against the best interest uh, of the global community, uh, including the long-term interests um, of all of us here. So we can only speculate on their rationale, um, but the trend exists and we have to prepa be prepared for it and think that it will get worse because I believe that it will. So what do we respond? So no individual business, no individual university, or even no individual government has the means to defend itself alone. We're in this together as a team and it's only in my view through unity of effort, all of us working together, um, that we have a fighting chance. Um, next, the cloud. Let's talk about the cloud. Move to something a little bit more pleasant, maybe, the cloud. Uh, so what are the threats? So like, that's a, there's a lot of talk today about the cloud and security in the cloud and use of the cloud and can we, can we trust it and is it safe? Uh, so here, here's what I tell you. Um, NSA has done a tremendous amount of work on the cloud. We, are, we have implemented our own cloud. Um, and so we've, we've done that certainly from a perspective of efficiency, 
many efficiencies we've gained. But by the way, security is right there beside it. So we have done tremendous amount of work on the security of the cloud. And our perspective is, first of all, uh, you know, certainly the efficiencies notwithstanding, that we believe we'll be able to do things from a security perspective we have never been able to do um, because of that. Now, you may say to me, and someone probably will, well, you know, but you put all your eggs in one basket, you become a big fat old target. Um, check, we got that. And, but we believe there are things that we can do that allow us to be able to defend that big fat old target in ways that we have never been able to do, particularly in a distributed environment that we live in today. So we're excited about the possibility, but there are threats that are posed from it. Um, and I've, I've listed them there. Certainly co-opting of cloud resources, um, using them in order to be able to launch and um, um, use, have engines behind the malicious activities that are, that are ongoing. And attackers, bad guys, purchasing cloud resources because uh, almost anybody can buy cloud resources in today's environment. So what's the response? Uh, ultimately, in the long term, we have to look at ways to extend trust up from the hardware into those cloud-borne applications and workloads. And this ultimately, we believe, will make it harder um, for attackers to be able to steal the resources, easier, easier for targets to distinguish legitimate cloud transactions um, from malicious ones. But this is going to be challenging because we've got work to do in understanding this space and managing it in the right way. Standards and best practices, we talked about continuous monitoring. I'll keep talking about that. That's critical because we can't trust that whatever measures we put in place will be sufficient. Uh, extensions of trust foundations into the cloud environment that allow us to do things like tag data and tag and have people credentials um, so that anyone who wants to have access to information in the cloud has to be legitimized by the individual and then illegitimized have access to that specific piece of data. Um, and, um, and we need a means for, by the way, extending reputation services um, into cloud-based services. And there's lots of research and development going on in that space, and I think lots of opportunity over time to be able to make some progress there. I talked, so I talked a little bit, but I thought important to just call out and from a security and the cloud perspective. These are some of the things that we think are, are really important. You know, separate accreditation of that cloud infrastructure, um, flexible accreditation uh, for the cloud infrastructure. Um, we need accreditation based on, on, on continuous monitoring so that we have a good understanding of what we're seeing and be able to respond appropriately. And then cloud security services as a business line. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily be separating security from IT. It ought to be an integral part of it, a standard component of um, any infrastructure that chooses to go in that space. So future of cyber defense. Um, not surprisingly, in, today, in today's world, um, national security systems are fundamentally dependent on commercial infrastructure. We've talked about that before. So we have to be able to respond to this by working hard to transform our business model into one that continues to um, encourage us to partner and team with industry and academia. I think we're on a really good path towards that. We have to be able to share information in real time, and that's just not government to government. Um, that's government with industry, with academia, so that when we are collectively as a body all looking uh, we, should get, we need to get to a point where we're collectively able to share what we see and be able to use that information to our own good to protect the things that matter most to us. Um, we have work to do in the area of laws and policies and standards and norms. I've talked about that a little bit already. Um, there is, uh, was great energy around legislative discussions about cyber policy this year. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. I'm convinced that we will. Um, Back when I was, was at the White House uh, 12 years ago, we weren't talking about this. It is music to my, hear, my ears to hear legislators talking about cybersecurity. Uh, and so I believe over time we're going to get um, the right policies and norms and laws in place to enable us to do all that we need uh, in this critical space. And then we've got we've to build and continue to build and invest in the cyber workforce. And NSA is very much committed to that. You heard about many of the areas that we're invested in just in this university alone. 
some of which I got to hear about for the first time. I didn't, hadn't heard about the program for high school students, girls. That's girls rule. That's, that's cool. Really, uh, really exciting work that we're doing with this university as well as many others across the nation, really trying to raise the bar. We have programs where we bring folks onto our campus uh, during the summertime and expose them to opportunities to be able to see the types of challenges that we have, encourage them to think about uh, some of the tough challenges and come back into the academic environment and look for ways that we can advance in those, uh, in those spaces. My conclusion, um, no big surprise, there's a broad spe spectrum of new and growing threats. Um, they keep me up at night. Yeah, that really does, uh, it really does worry me. Uh, but I am encouraged uh, by the great energy that I see expended towards these many challenges and problems. Um, and effective response tra st strategies uh, really have to look at it both, both from a defender and an attacker perspective at the same time. Um, and by the way, we, we often talk in U at NSA, look at ways to move people across those mission areas in order to be able to take advantage of, you know, defenders think one way, and those that are on the exploitation side think one way, and what a novel idea to be able to pull, uh, move folks across those mission areas and have that thinking, um, the, or the missions benefit by that new thinking. But the most effective responses, I firmly believe, is when we're able to have government and industry and academia working together. And ultimately, it's the unity of effort of all of us working together that I believe will allow us to have the greatest success in this space that we call cyber. So it's been my great pleasure to be with here, here with you today. And are we taking questions? I don't know. No questions. No, no, no I'm only kidding. No. <laughs> Uh, we do have questions. I, we, we have oh, darn. I was afraid of that. Yes. Uh, before I uh, turn to the questions, I'd just like to announce that the last time we had this event, our first uh, cybersecurity event, we had 140 people here in this audience. Uh, we have 300 here today, and we have 100 uh, watching this event. Uh, on the internet. So uh, my congratulations to everyone for attending to uh, your remarkable speech. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the uh, engaged part of our presentation today, this morning. Uh, it's going to be uh, moderated by Professor Nasser Memon, and I give the floor to Professor Nasser Memon to start the questions rolling for and to introduce our panelists. Thanks. Uh, first, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Plunkett for, for the very informative talk. I think we all have uh, much uh, enlighten much better understanding of what the challenges we face today and uh, what the landscape is and, and uh, what what kinds of things we need to do going forward so thank you so much uh, and as always I can't help but talk a little bit about uh, what we do here and some of the things that you mentioned for example uh, monitoring I mean, we've been developing techniques to monitor and summarize network traffic so it can be queried efficiently uh, supply chain, we have one of our faculty members, Ramesh Kari, who's been looking at hardware supply chain for quite some years. He's at the forefront of it. Uh, secure containers, Justin Kappus, our faculty member, has been looking at how to develop, design secure containers that, that to prevent uh, one application from uh, attacking another. Uh, and uh, defense based on understanding, one of our ex-alums and uh, a hacker in residence, Dan Guido, has been championing that, that approach that uh, we need to understand the attackers and, and build your defenses around that. So it was nice to hear that we, we, we've been doing some of the right things. Uh, so before, I, uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our, our panelists. Uh, we have, um, uh, sorry. 
have so many sheets here. Hmm. Uh, we have Bill's, Bill Wansley, uh, who is a senior vice president of Booz Allen and Hamilton, a consulting firm with a heritage that dates back nearly a century. Uh, Mr. Wansley is the man of the moment for those who follow cybersecurity news. He's frequently used to sort and exp explain threats and countermeasures from espionage to hacktivism. Uh, he leads Booz Allen's multidisciplinary management and technology teams in advanced cybersecurity services. Uh, he has recently focused on emerging risks in the financial sector. Uh, he, his clients range across government, non nonprofits, and business. Uh, Mr. Monsley has 30 years of experience as an operational a U.S. Army officer, a national security policy planner, and a management consultant for the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, for the past 14 years, he has supported U.S. intelligence community clients in solving national security risk-related challenges. He twice served in the national policy planning for J5 Joint Chiefs of Staffs. Uh, he holds a B.S. Uh, in engineering from the U.S. Military Academy. West Point, an MBA from Creighton University, and MMAS in theater operations from the School of Advanced Military Studies. Uh, while there, Mr. Wansley published monographs on tactical leadership and, and uh, peace theory. So please welcome Mr. Wansley. Or our second panelist is, is Bill Phelps, who is a managing director and leads uh, Accenture's North American security practice. Uh, he also leads Accenture's global program to help government and private sector organizations address the rapidly increasing cybersecurity threat. Uh, Mr. Phelps works across all industries with a recent focus on financial services and energy. Mr. Phelps spends much of his time advising senior level clients on the changing security landscape and its implications for their business. Uh, Mr. Phelps began his career at Accenture in 1986 and later left to found and build Seven Space, a startup company that provided remote infrastructure and application management. Uh, the company was sold to Sun Microsystems and now forms the core of Sun Management Systems. He also served on the board of True North Solutions, a security consulting firm. He rejoined Accenture in 2004. He holds a BA from the University of Connecticut and an MBA from the University of Texas, Austin, where he won the 1986 Moot Corp Venture Design Competition. Bill lives in Virginia with his wife and three children. So let's welcome Bill. So I'd like to sort of start the discussion perhaps from getting uh, your reaction uh, to Mrs. Plunkett's uh, talk. Uh, maybe. Uh, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. First off, <clears throat> I think Ms. Plunkett did an incredible job of covering a very wide landscape in the topic. Uh, when you think about everything from the you know, explosion of the um, uh, vulnerability uh, surface to um, supply chain security to the problems of the workforce, you get the sense that this is an extremely you know, broad and complex topic. You know, I kind of want to you know, just cite a, a recent news story to highlight some of the themes that came up. Um, some of you that may follow um, you know, the myriad security conferences are familiar with one of the most famous, which is DEF CON. Uh, DEF CON, for the second time this year, had something called DEF CON Kids. So it was a security subconference for you know, 10 to 18 year olds. One of the events in DEF CON Kids was a zero-day contest. The kids, um, you know, and this was co-founded by an 11-year-old girl. I think at 11 I can say girl and not young woman. Uh, you know, co-founded by an 11-year-old girl, they had a contest to identify zero-day vulnerabilities in software, and they found 80. And it's interesting to me and very notable to me because it says a couple things. Uh, one, it says, man, this is professionally developed software, you know, name brand companies, and over the course of a weekend, 10 to 18 year old kids were able to find 80 brand new vulnerabilities. Now, 
Um, and this is in the class of, largely in the class of devices that, you know, is exploding out there um, in terms of their prevalence. You know, I think it also says, you know, this is not just a problem for, you know, adults in large organizations and government. You know, the, 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 the young woman, girl who, who co-founded this, you know, kind of made her, made her name finding a vulnerability in a game on a cell phone. Um, and lastly, with the theme, and I was really excited to hear the focus of NYU Poly on developing um, women in cybersecurity, you know, this was, a, this was an 11-year-old girl who founded this. So anyway, I just I wanted to bring that up because I, I, I like the al alignment with some of the themes. But I, um, you know, this is a broad and complex area, and we are in the very, very early days of addressing this challenge. Yeah, that was terrific. Let me first say I think they were they were a remarkable job as well, uh, laying out the landscape and trying to identify the challenges. This this is uh, an issue that's hit its time, as she said. The time is now to embrace this challenge and think about cybersecurity differently. And for those of you who are students who are looking at you know what what does this mean to me and how am I going to make the world better, this is a way to do it. The uh, cybersecurity is not just about catching criminals. It's not about being a cop. It's about really looking holistically at the impact of our digitized society and how criminals, and they are criminals that are doing these attacks, how criminals are affecting our quality of life, our financial status in the world, and our ability to interact together globally. So it does make a difference for us all, and it does make a difference for the world that you get involved in this. And we need people with multidisciplinary backgrounds. This is not just about the technology. There is a huge human element and behavioral part to this. Everyone has to understand that policy, governance, behavior, uh, as well as the technology is essential to understanding the threats, developing the responses, as Deborah pointed out, and taking on the challenge of making our society a better place. It's not just about shutting down the bad guys with some technology. So I really hope we can have a discussion on this panel today about some of those challenges and how the, some of this audience would like to pursue this discussion. So that, that's a very interesting point because uh, as Jerry brought it up, the, the today's, uh, our, our president Jerry Halton mentioned that today's young generation is, uh, has a passion for creating a better world. And uh, that's what they're coming out from colleges and universities saying, hey, uh, we're going to graduate and create a better world. That's the message that they are getting and also uh, resonating with. And at the same time, if we want to try to attract them to security, it kind of, we, we sometimes start telling them, hey, uh, we'll teach you how to break systems or find vulnerabilities and find the bad guys and things like that. And we don't frame it as Bill very nicely did about, hey, it's, it's not about just bad things. It's actually about, uh, Deborah, uh, Mrs. Plunkett, you could say something about. I, really, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. The s small piece of the problem that I'm, personally responsible for um, has, has unique and different requirements and pressures. But at the end of the day, my small piece can't get better if the bigger piece can't get better. And that really then touches on every single one of us in so many different ways. So. I'll, I'll make a comment if, if we kind of start a discussion around uh, threat actors. Uh, we're finding, as, as, as Deborah mentioned, that there are nation states involved, there are hacktivists involved, there are organized crime groups involved, and we've all characterized these different threat actors. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the vocabulary, we use threat actors to describe all those people, although on a, any given day they may be working for, a, for themselves, for a country, or for an organized crime. Uh, there are mercenaries doing this. Uh, but understanding who they are, how they operate, uh, the traditional intelligence view is to look at capabilities and intent. In the cyber world, and cyber intelligence, we look at capabilities, intent, and opportunities. Because as technology changes, the opportunities become more and more obvious with mobile devices and the cloud and so on. So starting to understand who these people are, what they're trying to do, what their objectives are, helps us think more clearly about what are the appropriate strategies to address those. And frankly, go on the offensive, not, not in an illegal way, not to attack them, but to understand how to get in front of them intellectually and understand how they're coming at you and be proactive and so that you take, the, you take the venom out of their bite before they get to you. 
And that's the challenge I would offer, again, this, this group of people, is how do we get in front of them so that we, we don't have to worry about spending as amazing amounts of dollars of technology to try to stop them all the time. So, uh, Ms. Blanket, can I? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> so so, so let, let, let me uh, change that a little bit. One question is how do you get right in front of them? Uh, the other question is who gets in front of them in the sense that in the physical world, we look to the government to maintain a safe and secure atmosphere. The law enforcement agency, etc., keeps the streets of New York safe and secure. Uh, but in cyberspace, uh, we look to vendors. And uh, so, is the, should the government be playing a bigger role in, in uh, sort of getting ahead of these threat actors, doing the intelligence, sharing, uh, what, securing the infrastructure, not just in the grid sense, but, but the infrastructure that affects uh, grandpa and grandma when, when they're going on the internet, for example. What role should the government should play and uh, can play? So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say that, um, you know, back to, the, to Bill's comments about quality of life and about mm -hmm. it, we've got to make it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. What I, I firmly believe is, is that it, it will take um, and aware, quite frankly, indignation by all of us. You know, we all just need to get really angry. And I think when we all get angry enough, we can start making demands on service providers, on vendors, on developers, um, to make sure that the right level of security, the appropriate level of security is off the shelf, built in to the products and services that we use. Because we ought to be getting really tired of, of being stolen from. We ought to be, get really tired of not being able to trust that we can operate safely in the space. So, you know, I, from, a, from a government perspective, is there a role? Of course there's a role. There's information that the government has access to that others don't. Mm -hmm. um, and the government is looking hard at how we can use that information to best advantage for the good of us all. I think we're making advances in that space. There is the work of government that has to take place. Some of it qu quite sensitive and critical to our national security. We've got to make sure that that work is allowed to take place. And then I think, you know, the government has served and continues to serve as a partner in this space mm -hmm. and both sharing and ideas. And, you know, I'm, I'm quick to say uh, among my workforce and the others in the community, um, NSA does not have a lock on good ideas sure. by no stretch. Um, good ideas come from a whole lot of places and we're looking for them all the time. And so creating the forum and participating in the forum where we can have those exchanges of good ideas, I think helps advance the ball. I was going to say, I think that without getting into what the government should or shouldn't be doing, it's an extremely contentious topic right now uh, you know, in Washington. Right now, the role of the private sector organization in defending themselves from cyber threats is fundamentally different than the role of a private sector organization in defending themselves against more traditional threats. You know, if you own a warehouse, you expect that there's a police force that's defending it from somebody breaking in and stealing your equipment. If you have a database full of information, the role that you have in defending that information from being stolen, it's a much greater onus on the organization than it is on the government right now for better or worse. It's just, it's just the, the way the situation has evolved. And one of the things that, that we're seeing, and again, it's not, I'll call it, you know, an active role for the private sector organization or commercial organization, how you want to put it, uh, in terms of, of uh, vigilantism, but certainly moving to more, moving beyond simple defense we're going to put up a fence and we're going to keep people out with that fence. Organizations are, are having to say, people will get over that fence. Mm -hmm. They will find themselves inside of our gates, sometimes for a long period of time. And the, the expertise is moving more toward how do we detect them once they're inside how do we figure out what they're doing, what they might have stolen, and evict them in a programmatic way 
so that they stay out. So the, the you know, moving beyond a, a defensive posture, which is, is extremely important, I don't want to minimize it, but to more of a mitigate and respond posture, assuming that you're going to have burglars in your midst. If, if I can just build on that, that's a great point. I think we all have responsibility for cybersecurity. The government has a very clear role in defending our nation's uh, borders. Industry has huge concerns and a role in defending their enterprise and the risk associated with a cyber attack. And we come back to the risk discussion. That's where it's really about for a business. Nonprofits care about defending their, their environment and their ideas and their operations and what they're doing. And all of us as individuals care about our personal privacy, that the very hackers who are attacking companies in protest of legislation about internet privacy are the ones who violate your privacy every day. So think about all of us having responsibilities, and we can start through forums like this to, uh, in, to raise the awareness of all college students, of all business people, that everyone has a role, and there are overlapping circles of, of a Venn diagram for the government's role, for the individual's role, for the corporate role, as we all have to work together in a public-private partnership, hopefully, to share information, to defend ourselves, and to ensure our own liberty and pursuit of pro prosperity. So, so on those lines, uh, the, the list that Mrs. Plunkett uh, gave earlier about the companies that were intruded uh, over the last one year and the fact that 11-year-old girl can uh, break into find 80 vulnerabilities, it's sort of from an awareness kind of point of view, it, in some sense, it, it sort of gives a negative message, it kind of message of uh, we're losing the battle, uh, but there are lots of success stories there. We've, we've, we've done, uh, there is hope, I mean, uh, to, and, and we've done good things as well. Uh, could you sort of maybe give some examples of where we've been successful? You're not just sitting and, and being intruded every day by everyone who wants to, including 11-year-olds, but we've actually succeeded at, uh, at protecting our, our assets as well. Uh, and there are many examples where you've done a good job. <coughs> I think we're making a lot of progress. I think you can go back to some of the points that Deborah made and say it's an asymmetric threat. There is somebody out there that can breach pretty much any defense that we can develop right now with enough money and it's not typically even a technical breach as much as it's a social engineering or other things. So. You know, can I sit and tell you that there are organizations that have developed 100% defensive capability? I can't. I don't. <laughs> my my colleagues here can. Um, I will say that that um, the awareness of the threat at senior levels in organizations and the extent to which um, boards of directors, um, business executives are putting this on, are putting cybersecurity on their agenda as a corporate priority has moved dramatically in the last five years. You know, I, I, I haven't seen an exact study. I would say anecdotally, if, if it was 20% of private sector organizations five years ago that had cybersecurity as an executive level priority, it's 75% or 80% today. Uh, and that means a lot of organizations are significantly improving their capability um, and, and this ripples through a lot of different attributes. The reporting, you know, how senior the senior most security person is, where they report, how much visibility they have with the board of directors. So I think we're making a lot of progress on the system to make cybersecurity better in organizations, um, there's still a long way to go in, in having that ripple through to, you know, really good defense. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll speak for Deborah so she can't. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the National Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security that's actually responsible for leading the, the defense of our country's networks are doing remarkable things every day and they are making significant progress and obviously we, don't, we can't talk a lot about that because that's their job and they, they want to ensure that they don't give away any additional vulnerabilities or who they haven't caught. Um, there is progress and Bill and I both probably see it in our client spaces where corporations, nonprofits, and government agencies are really turning the tide 
there is a sense of optimism now within some of the staff that are taking on these APT hunt. For those of you who don't know, that's Advanced Persistent Threat Hunt Teams, which is a combination of network analysis, forensic analysis, and malware analysis in a way to identify who's on your network, because as we mentioned earlier, there are only two types of organizations in the world, those who are compromised and those who haven't realized it quite yet. <laughs> so if you accept the fact that somebody's probably on your network already, and you have to do that continuous monitoring to be aware of what's happening. You have to be checking all the time what's breaking all the time. And I think we see a lot of companies led by the financial services industry, frankly, they're probably at the top of the game. And other industries that have a lot of intellectual capital and property they're trying to protect are taking great steroids. And they are actually stopping and they're, they're reducing these attacks. But you can't ever have perfect security, but you can make significant progress to manage the risk to your enterprise by having a good strategy, having people trained and aware, and a, a, a way to think about cybersecurity as a part of your daily operations. So I didn't mean to be so doom and gloom, I don't no. think. <laughs> uh, but um, so here, here's the good news um, for me, and this happens on a, on a weekly basis for sure. Uh, I recently had a conversation with uh, Chief Information Security Officer and a Senior Vice President from uh, an electric power entity. And the conversation went something like this um, from them. Um, I'm really worried. I'm really worried about the security of my networks. Um, and so I need help. And uh, so I pointed them to the places that I thought they would want to engage to get some help. So that was good news number one for me is a recognition that you, you need to be worried. I mean, that is just marvelous progress. Um, and the second, second piece of information, which was new to me, was that the board of directors for this particular entity now has a clause written in their board contract requiring them to have a responsibility for security. Wow. I mean, this was like, really? So we've come a long way, baby. We really, really have in this space raising the bar, I'm getting folks to be worried because what's going to come after that worry after you go through despair and, you know, ultimately acceptance comes, got to do something about it. And I think we have a lot of uh, entities in our space now who are in the want to do something about it. That's really good news. Yes. Well, we have, we have a number of questions, questions from our uh, audience here as well as those uh, participating on the Internet. Uh, the first question. Uh, which has not been addressed yet, but I think it would be useful to hear the response of um, Deborah as well as the rest of the panel and uh, Nasser as well. Uh, what is your reaction to the fact that Congress has failed to pass the cybersecurity legislation this year? Does that put the United States more at risk? <laughs> <laughs> Stunned. I thought the conventions were last night. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'll, I'll just say it, it, it's disappointing the legislation wasn't passed. I think those of us who work, and both Bill and I are out of the Washington area most of our time, who wa watch the legislation process, we all understand that uh, that can be frustrating to address all equities in resolving any kind of legislation. Uh, we do need legislation to empower uh, government agencies and law enforcement to be able to effectively prosecute uh, cyber criminals. Uh, we do need legislation to protect industries that are providing telecommunications to the federal agencies. We do le need legislation to uh, allow better cooperation, public-private pi partnership and information sharing between uh, the, the private sector who control the critical infrastructure of our nation and the government that use that infrastructure on a daily basis. So there are a number of pieces of legislation that have been put together, I think over eight over the past year. Um, we, we are, those of us who watch this uh, legislation moving forward hope that there's some progress in the next couple months. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on a couple of Washington boards, as I'm sure Bill is as well, and get a front row seat to some of the debate around these topics. And you know, there, there are very, very strong, legitimate competing interests. Um, Could you describe them? You know, um, 
I think it's a, you, know, you, you can see in the election right now, there's a, you know, um, a broad debate about the role of the government and regulation. And I think that that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be open and say I'm, I'm not going to get too dis specific because, um, you know, we have some general guidelines in my organization about taking sides on questions like this. But I will say that the general topic of what's the role of the government as a regulatory entity versus the private sector is a self-policing, um, you know, community uh, is, is, is at the core of a lot of this. I mean, we can agree, I think everybody can agree on topics like improved education. You know, we, we need more cyber professionals. Nobody's arguing that point. But on the hard question of what, how do you encourage organizations to <coughs> um, more stringently address the cyber threat, I think there are folks that would come down on, on different sides of that. I think that there's a lot, as Deborah has pointed out, there's a lot of progress. And people could easily point to a lot of the progress in the private sector, um, you know, the awareness, the engagement of the boards, um, the, uh, you know, reiteration by the SEC that, you know, a serious breach is a reportable event as evidence that the system we have now works. Deborah, what is the NSA's position on this legislation, or does it have one? Well, how about I give you Deborah's position on it? <laughs> um, and that is that, and I, I spoke a little bit to this already, the first is that I am thrilled that the conversation is happening. Um, that's, a, that's a great, yeah, is it, is it as, is it, you know, am I, am I disappointed that we're not there? Sure. I'd be disingenuous if I said I wasn't. So um, I predict we're going to have legislation. It will happen. I am convinced that it will. Uh, and I think it's going to happen in the next year. And I'm also pretty convinced that one year after it happens, we'll think it's not enough. All right? Thank because you. we're going to get smarter, and, um, and we'll get smarter about what we need. The next question. Uh, also from people watching on the internet or here in the audience, how large a threat does the nation state hacking from China, Russia, and other countries pose to the United States? Also stunned silence. Oh, significant. I, I don't know how else to characterize it. I spoke to it. Um, not explicitly calling out specific nations, but spoke to it. Uh, the, the threat of an increased level of sophistication, capability, and intentions by very capable nation states um, poses significant dangers. We should be concerned. I think there is a significant risk to uh, national security. There's significant risk to the loss of intellectual capital from uh, US-based corporations. There is significant risk in the loss of uh, new ideas, thoughts flowing from our nonprofit organizations in the United States. Anybody who has an idea of value is at risk, and that's fundamental to our, our Constitution is protecting that. So I, I do believe there is risk. It's not a minor issue. If you've, you know, there are a number of cases that both Bill and I could probably tell you of our clients have realized after the fact that they've lost some very important intellectual capital from their organization that has significant financial implications for companies and sometimes shuts them down. So depending on where you sit, you may not feel that risk directly, but if you just lost your job because your company got hacked, uh, you feel it very directly. Any comments? Yeah, I, I'd echo what Bill said. I mean, without getting into attribution, you know, there's an awful lot of intellectual property theft at the root of cyber attacks, particularly this, the so-called advanced persistent threat. I mean, a lot of what's driving that is the theft of information, and the theft of you know, valuable intellectual property has an economic consequence, a significant one. There's another question about uh, a part of the theme that was addressed by Deborah's talk, and that is collaboration. Uh, are there any examples of uh, strong collaboration between industry, government, and academic life that you would point to as examples? 
Well, I could point to one, um, and, and there are really uh, many, many of them, but the Department of Homeland Security and their role as, as the front door for the U.S. government for engagement with critical infrastructure um, has been hosting with the di different critical infrastructure sectors um, sessions to educate and inform about threat and about mitigation. We've partnered with DHS in that space and have done road shows all across the nation going in and explaining exactly what the threat is, and in some instances in a classified forum, um, and then explicitly explaining what you need to do to be able to address them. They have been wildly successful by all accounts, and you know the accolades coming from the industry partners who are sitting in the room um, anxious to hear, but even more anxious to know what to do about it, has really been phenomenal. Um, we've got, you know, I've talked about the Centers of Academic Excellence, where we partner with colleges and universities and um, both understanding and then developing the curricula. Um, we recently, just this year, stood up a new CAE for cyber operations. Again, very much focused on how can we ensure that over the years to come, we're graduating students that have the skills that we need in order to have a competitive advantage in space. Are there any examples from industry that drive these collaborative efforts that you would point to as being uh, paradigmatic or exemplary? Not sure. I, <laughs> it's exemplary. I, I think that you know, the examples, like the one Deborah used of a utility industry organization that, that came and um, spoke to the, uh, to the agency, um, the, the NSA does a lot to educate the private sector. Uh, a lot of it is quiet. You know, it's, it's um, you know, a lot of work has been done to ensure that people in the private sector have the clearances that are required to, you know, obtain that information. More and more people um, in, you know, my clients in industry, obviously this has been going on in the defense industrial base for years and years and years. But as you look into banking and energy and other industries that you wouldn't traditionally think of as government contractors, the people who are performing security functions in those organizations are you know, um, being granted clearances, which typically would only be go to somebody that was working on a government project. They're being um, briefed you know, at NSA, at Homeland Security, at other places. Um, you know, I could, I could be critical, you know, of information flow, but I think it's easier to say within the current f legal frameworks, I think both sides are working very hard to get closer together. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we want some legislation to protect uh, organizations that are sharing information that may be subject to regulatory requirements or privacy requirements of certain types of information. And the legislation will help considerably with that. But to Bill's point, there are the, uh, the, frankly, the critical infrastructure um, protection structure that flowed from President Bill Clinton's Presidential Decision Directive 63, which established a lot of the critical information sectors and established the ISACs, the, the information sharing bodies under those sectors, has been really helpful some operate better than others, as Bill mentioned, uh, but some of them have spun off other information sharing within specific industries. And as you all know, sometimes the informal communications can be much more effective than the formal. <laughs> and there, I tell you what, if you could talk to any CISO, he probably calls his other CISOs in his industry on a regular routine basis. And there's pretty significant cooperation at that level that, uh, frankly, until we get the legislation that allows that to come up, that's probably more effective than some of the formal coordination. Uh, in, in connection with the information sharing, there's a question here. Uh, there is a fear that by sharing the details of a compromised attack, it could negatively impact the reputation of the firm or even present new attack methods. So how do we move past the actuality of starting sharing data with the everyday benefit and fears of these experiences? Well, we have to build a community of trust. And I believe there are, there are efforts underway to build those communities of trust such that you know that you can share information with certain individuals within different companies and sectors. Know that that information is safe. Um, know that it's going to be used for specific purposes, not to ex necessarily expose the fact of, 
um, but rather they use it to learn from, to help develop mitigations to, to warn others about the potential. And it's that community of trust I think is really critical um, to both um, respecting um, and um, not harming the reputation of companies that rely on you know, uh, the, the business of trust, um, but also uh, helping those of us that want to be able to exchange that information, get what we need, and be able to have, make a difference. Any comment from? No? Good. Uh, we're coming to the end of uh, the morning session and our event here at Poly. And I'd like to ask the panel one last question individually. If you had one message to give the audience here at Poly and on the internet, what would, you, what would be your takeaway? Let's start with Bill Wainsley. I'd say the one takeaway that's most important to everyone is training education awareness. We can't get to the rest of the problem set until we all understand the problem, people understand how to respond to the problem, and they start thinking about cybersecurity as much as they do locking their car in their house every day when, when they go, go to work. But we start educating everyone to understand the challenges and we start making routine practices uh, of protecting information we will all be in a safer place and we will all maintain our personal privacy. Bill? I'm actually going to hit two, one really quick, which is for all the students, you know, you're in an absolutely great space. You know, there's zero unemployment and information security. I've, I've heard people say there's negative unemployment, which I guess that means a lot of people are working second jobs. But anyway, um, great space. Um, second, you know, this is, security is multidisciplinary. The, almost all the you know, most significant breaches have a social engineering dimension to them. So I, I really, you know, in, in, in my work, and I'm sure Bill, Deborah, and theirs, um, we as, as employers, as people responsible for improving information security, need people who understand the technology and have the ability to communicate the importance of security and the consequences of um, weak security to non-technical people. So I would strongly encourage everyone to think, especially I'm talking to the, to the students and people who are developing their capabilities, to think about both sides, their, their communication skills and their technical skills. And Deborah? Well, I think I'd, I'd probably end where I started uh, in my talk, and that is that the time is now. And that if each one of us leaves this place better informed about both the risks and the opportunities um, in cyberspace, then I think we will have made a tremendous investment of time today into the future. And I challenge you to, to take this away and, you know, each one teach one. Each one of us has to be just that informed and just that committed. Uh, this has been another extraordinary morning of cybersecurity intelligence from an intelligent group. Uh, and my thanks to Deborah and to both Bills and uh, Professor Memon for uh, managing a very exciting and very informative group session. Thank you very much. <laughs>